Welcome everyone for, for those of you who've already signed up. Um, we're a few minutes early, so we're just going to let people enter the room. Normally we start around three minutes after the scheduled time that um, allows for any sort of late arrivals. People have signed up but um, have uh, not managed to get to the to the um, to their computer or to their phone in time. So once again, everyone, it is it is um, four o'clock in Lisbon and London. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm not going to start just yet. Normally, we allow around two to three minutes post the start time, just to allow any sort of late stragglers to to sign in. Um, and there are still a few people signing in. So please bear with us. It will not affect the schedule of the webinar as a whole. Um, we will still keep to within the time. What I am going to use these first few minutes um, for before we get started formally is um, to thank all of those who've already sent through questions. Um, I haven't had time to go through all of those, but we will go be going through as many of those as possible at the end of the webinar. Um, there are at least sort of 15 to 20 of those that, uh, that were sent through and any of those that I feel that we probably need to consult with a, with a lawyer or someone on our legal panel, then I will just skip over and, and, um, and then publish the answers to those uh, directly to the person who asked the question, for example. Uh, but there is a Q&A um, part uh, or, or section on your webinar. So feel free during the webinar to jot down a question as the topic arises. And then after I've gone through the questions that were sent to me in advance, I will then get to the questions that are posted during the webinar as well. And we will see how many questions not only we can get to, but that we can answer. Um, um, I suppose just as a caveat, uh, we are not lawyers. Um, I'm sure you're, you're happy probably that you don't have a lawyer on a call again, um, but with all due respect to our lawyer friends, um, so we we are very much focused on the the immigration and the migration part of, of of all this, and we deal with all sorts of different aspects. But we are not um, qualified to offer legal tax or financial advice. So even what we say here, when it touches on those areas, we would highly recommend that you take independent advice from duly qualified professionals because it's important that you get um, you know, not only a substantial answer, we're not going to give you wrong answers, I don't believe, but, um, but that, that sort of information should come from a professional. Anyway, um, we are now um, two minutes over and therefore, if I may, I am going to just maximize my screen and welcome you all to this webinar. Um, it's the 27th of July, and you can see from probably from the small screen in the corner of, of uh, your screen that the sun is on my face. I'm sitting at the moment in Cascais uh, in Portugal, and um, it's been there have been some lovely uh, days here. Um, but as we all know, uh, we have been facing globally some rather um, a difficult time. So our thoughts are with people in in Northern Europe, in China, even in the West Coast of the US, uh, which have been really hammered by things such as wildfires. Canada, the West Coast has been a heat wave. So, you know, um, we well know, um, and our thoughts are with you all, um, um, given that Portugal is often uh, um, a victim of some of these climactic changes. Um, we also hope, having been a, um, a COVID sufferer myself, that everyone is attending and their families are keeping safe. Uh, and that's really the most important um, aspect in these times where travel is quite difficult. Um, and this leads us quite nicely into the topic of our presentation today, which is about Portuguese residents and the paths to Portuguese residency in the current context, really. And I'm going to talk today for around 40 minutes or so on the two most common uh, routes taken to residency in Portugal, and that is the either the Golden Visa or the D7. And we're hopefully we're going to share some information that will allow you individually 
to get a sense of which one may be right for you and better than the other one. So a little bit about us. Um, we were founded in 2014 as a business. Um, our focus really is on what we call IRM, which is International Retirement Migration. And as the name says, many of our clients and customers and, and, and acquaintances and friends are actually pre-retirees or retirees. Although we do work extensively with families, especially those that are moving to Europe and typically uh, put their children into international schools, something of the sort. We work increasingly with digital nomads um, as well. Um, we don't tend to work with many business people. And the reason being that Portugal is not really the ideal uh, destination as a business um, um, center. We don't tend to have a, a hugely vibrant job market with some notable exceptions. And the tech market is one of those. So there are some interesting, very interesting opportunities in Portugal around the technology sector. Um, some of you will have heard, no doubt, about the Web Summit, and that is a, a bringing together of, of ideas and capital, the largest gathering of such type in the world. And that happens in Lisbon once a year around October, and it has been going for a couple of years and will continue for, um, for around another six or seven. Anyway, we are UK headquartered business. Um, we have destination markets, um, Portugal and Spain. Those are the two main foci for the business. And we have ambassadors, people that represent us as a business and what we do in a range of diverse markets such as Sweden and Brazil, the US and France, um, in addition to the direct presence that we have in those markets. We have a multilingual team located in the regions of Portugal. Um, primarily concentrated in the Algarve, uh, Greater Lisbon, extending out west to Cascais, where I'm sitting at the moment, and Porto. We get inquiries from around 75 countries, uh, which indicates to us that this is a fairly broad topic, not necessarily people just looking to move to Portugal and to reside in Portugal, but the migration of people across country borders, notwithstanding the huge limitations that we have faced as a result of COVID itself. This is still very much an active topic alive to many people around the globe. We have clients from around 30 countries um, and we have many years of experience with the uh, schemes or the programs such as the NHR, the non-habitual residency, the D7 and the golden visa. We often get asked by UK clients how we have so much experience and we often remind them that the UK only um, um, left the EU at the end of last year effectively and therefore there have been many countries outside the EU before, EU before then and we have been working with many of those countries in particularly um, North Americans, so Americans uh, and Canadians um, they have been our clients for, for many years in these areas. We are the only company to work strategically with both rentals and sales Portugal wide. So, so we, we are atheists in that sense. We do not mind if people decide to rent or to, or to buy or to rent before they buy. But we, we, we understand that accommodation in the more general sense is a key aspect of a move to a new country. You must have somewhere to live. And so that that tends to, <clears throat> excuse me, that tends to always form somewhat of a focus of, of, um, um, of the work that we do. We also like to be democratic in the sense of budgets, and we try to go out of our, out of our way to help people with all sorts of budgets. And we work with people with rentals from as little as 500 euros to 4,000 euros plus, and property sales from as little as 75,000 to, to as much as over 2 million. Now, I should make a point there, of course, that doesn't mean we can find a 500 euro rental in a location that typically rents for 2,000. It means that we can typically help people with 500 euro budgets in locations that have 500 euro um, rentals, for example. So I think I want to make the point we're not magicians, um, but we do work hard for for the people who ask for our help. Um, at the core to what we do is how we do it. And we do a lot of what we do by using a, a network of specialist partners that we have built up over the years. We have around we have more than 50 um, of these specialists, including lawyers, banks, insurance, come car importation companies, and so on. So often people gravitate towards us as a hub through which to use to, to through which to locate these services. And we have a network of over 120 real estate 
um, um, agencies, what we call listing agents. And these would the, be the people on the ground that allow us to work on your behalf to sort of locate um, properties, if you will, or, 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 or solutions in very localized market. You know, if, if one single company tells you they're everywhere, even a large institutional brand name that you'll probably know, that's very difficult to achieve because even a franchise is, is individual and they don't necessarily have the granularity to get down to the detail. Um, in one of the regions, um, and people can certainly go and look at that, we operate via relationships with owners, um, one of the largest long-term rental portfolios, and that's on algarvelonglets.com. And we also like to um, uh, be active in terms of understanding what the market is doing. And we are one of the most active businesses in terms of capturing data. We're not cap necessarily trying to capture emails and telephone numbers and the like, but opinion of people um, who, who are looking at moving to Portugal. And we, we have a rolling survey. And at the end of this presentation, I will, I will share with you the link. We will also afterwards share the video of the presentation in case somehow some of you missed a particular point. And we will share that link of the presentation with you. So, um, why Portugal and why is it such a blockbuster option for residency? I remember with one of our American partners um, many years ago, um, about eight or ten, we, um, we um, um, uh, proposed to them to actually um, consider the Portuguese market as a destination. And they were very skeptical initially. And this was around, as I say, eight years ago. And today that, that um, company has Portugal as one of its major international markets for its retiree or migrating retirees. Um, and that's the transformation that has occurred with Portugal as a destination for residency um, um, for many, many international expatriate clients. It's, it's become known. It's, 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 it's become appealing. And there are some fundamentals. Safety, it's the third or this year, fourth safest country in the world. It's got very, very friendly people, um, including importantly, the second best at integrating migrants. And often when we see the word migrants, we think, oh, um, refugees and the like. We are also very, very proactive in integrating refugees. And in fact, we cannot um, get enough refugees to accept our quotas because typically the state will not pay much money but but um we 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 integrate everyone from wealthy billionaires to the refugee fleeing war in a war-torn region of the world so the the outgoing and the and the accommodating nature of the portuguese is definitely a factor for the attraction of Portugal as a whole. Um, the ease of travel and connectivity, you probably could say this for any European country, to be fair. The 12th best, 12th best healthcare in the world, uh, which is for our US um, attendees and listeners, is around 90% cheaper than, it, than what you will um, pay in the, in the, um, in the US, with taking co-payments and the like into account. Um, again, using the US dollar as a basis for comparison, um, it's, it's a fairly stable currency, the euro, and from an, a forex perspective, the rate is remarkably similar four years later um, to, uh, to, to what the rate was in 2017. Um, the country is no longer a best kept secret, but is a best place in the world to retire, in particularly back to this whole theme of retirement. Uh, many, many awards. The weather is particularly good and, and neutral. We do get warm months, uh, July and August in particular, but they don't tend to be very humid um, um, specifically, although one needs to look at it to how well insulated houses are. Um, it is a low cost of living by Western European standards, although some people are very surprised by how some items are very expensive. We have hugely expensive fuel, unbelievable how much tax the government actually charges through a fuel price um, um, which means that, uh, that the fuel becomes one of the, the, the most expensive in, in Europe, I think the third most expensive. So things like um, gas or, 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 or fuel, petrol, um, electricity, um, electronic goods, and, and in some instances housing itself is not as cheap as perhaps people um, uh, perceive it to be. 
Um, and then, of course, the topic of today's conversation, which is the Golden Visa or the D7 residency programs overlaid with what we call tax programs, such as the non-habitual residency. So uh, the Golden Visa is a residency solutions, a solution. For those who don't know already, there are essentially four real estate golden visa categories. I am going to focus on because that is 99% of the inquiries we get, uh, maybe 95%. The other 4.5% are through investment funds, qualified investment funds. And then the remaining is through the turnaround of existing businesses, investment in the sciences, in the arts, and so on. I will not be covering any of those because they represent a very small percentage. And in fact, of the of the people signed up to this webinar, we only had one question about the non-real estate visa, which was about an arts visa, which I'll, I won't respond to here. I will just deal with that separately. Um, the golden visa categories de depend essentially on location and whether those locations are designated as high density or low density populational areas. And then within that, we have two uh, levels, if you will. One which is the standard level and the other one is calculated based on whether the, the property has been involved or is part of a regeneration program. So an older property that has been regenerated as part of an urban regeneration program. And so that creates four real estate golden visa thresholds with the numbers that you see there. Um, where have historically the golden visa buyers bought? Historically, they have bought in Lisbon. Lisbon's historical neighborhoods, the Baixa and so on, followed by Porto historical um, areas. And also there's been quite a lot of purchasing, for example, by Brazilians and South Africans in the Cascais area, which is west of Lisbon. Most of those, if they are not residential properties, so there are some um, nationalities that will actually buy or invest in the golden visa and then live in the property. Um, and this in particular at the early stages of the Golden Visa program happened with certain nationalities. But if people choose not to live in their property, then most of the properties have been short term revenue generating properties or those with some sort of fixed income from the developer in, in, in a developer incentive program. Um, many people have not wanted, wanted to spend 500000 if they could spend 350000 This was particularly the case in areas such as Lisbon and Porto. Those days largely are gone um, due to the inflationary um, effect of so many golden visa investments, in particular from the Chinese market, which really set the benchmark in terms of pricing in some of the areas of the country. Um, it's very difficult to find um, the sorts of property that people want, for a, for example, for a future residence um, at the 350,000 level. Uh, we're doing, we're undertaking three of these searches in Porto at the moment, and they are not proving um, easy, not because we cannot find properties for 350,000, but because they must meet every single condition demanded by the, the the borders agency called SEF in order to qualify for the program. So difficult to find at the moment of the 350,000. Um, and the other thing that I point out is that the lower cost golden visas often have a high price per square meter. So there has been a golden visa inflationary effect, which has seen the cheaper golden visa properties shoot up in terms of price per square meter as a result of demand. Where do we think uh, new golden visa buyers should be considering? Um, we think they should be considering um, low entry level um, um, investments in areas, in popular areas, such as the Algarve. So they are limited opportunities, but they should hold their value. And importantly, we uh, lawyers tell us that they are resaleable to another golden visa applicant in five years time, assuming, of course, the program still exists. So. Um, other than, you know, contrary to high density areas, these 280,000 type investment um, golden visas will be in low density areas, which are not affected by the changes I will talk about in the next slide. The other thing that we, we quite like um, uh, from a golden visa perspective is what we call the 400,000 golden visa. So it's in a low density area, but on the coast. Again, in the next slide, I will show you the map. But there are coastal areas 
um, that will still qualify for the golden visa. And we particularly like the coastal areas where you can still get what we call a small portfolio. Um, you can maybe put together two properties, revenue generating properties. Uh, normally, they would come with a with a with some sort of history. Um, maybe not the property itself, but the area in terms of revenue generation, some interesting yields, and that still is a bit of an investment play for for an investment um, for an investor looking for the golden visa. Um, and then we recommend the five hundred thousand um, um, high density area. Again, I'll talk about it in the next slide the fact that it will end um, at the end of the year. But we want um, it's a clean and quick decision and we are running out of time in these areas that will end by the end of the year which i'll talk about so you need to be quick to act in that area no complications buy something that qualifies at the highest levels no other questions asked areas to avoid at the moment and this is time sensitive we recommend avoiding the three hundred and fifty thousand um, refurbishment 30 years old in a refurbishment um, um, area um, or rehabilitation area rather I should say for the simple reason that we feel that it's too short a time frame to answer all the questions in the main so up until June of this year we 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 did say to people that there should be enough time you know unless you're ready to move literally in the next week or so we would say beware buyer beware of that golden visa because it will have um some some challenges in terms of bringing together the 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 documentation and then the high density areas that are historical because as some of you may have heard there have been limitations on the issuing of short-term rental licenses in these areas and so we do not want people to to find that they've bought uh, acquired a, pr a property that then they can't can't rent out um, short term although having said that again because of COVID a lot of those short-term properties have moved to the long-term rental market but in principle the point is that the short-term renting or what we call a logemental local will be limited in many of these areas so what golden visa changes have um, are will come about um, effectively the golden visa will end for high a density residential um, um, acquisitions by the end of the year okay so the map that you see on the left of the slide the blue areas are all those that continue to qualify the gray areas apologies i it may not be that visible to you but my cursor is sort of going up and down the gray, gray areas you can see mostly on the coast um, will be excluded and the red areas are um, um, low density municipalities within a high density, um, um, sorry, low density areas within a high density municipality. So exceptions. Um, so you will find that those of you who want to be on the coast in the main will not be able to access the Golden Visa program after the end of the year. Um, a few facts and figures about the program. Um, it offers residence, so it's something I'm going to clear up right now. The Golden Visa program offers residence and citizenship is after is possible after five years of continuous residence. Um, and you move from, a, from a, a temporary residence during those five years to a permanent residence. And you do not have to apply for citizenship. You can obtain your permanent residence without becoming a citizen. So two questions that we often get asked there. Um, the amount invested in the program to date, I believe, is over six billion. Um, the Chinese are still the largest investors as a result of the historical investment they, they made initially into the program, followed by Brazil, Russia, South Africa, Turkey, and so on. Um, and there has been a tenfold increase from U.S. applicants, but from a very low base. Um, the 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 commercial and touristic properties will continue to be eligible in these high density areas which will be excluded from which residential properties will be excluded by the end of the year um, briefly the closing costs on property purchases so you have two you have two costs associated with a golden visa buying the property and all the costs associated with it and forgive me sometimes these things change slightly so i've got it slightly wrong there will always be a, a quote given by the appropriate lawyer but i think these are pretty close uh, the closing cost for the purchase of the property you can count on spending five to eight percent of the purchase price the transfer um, tax is a sliding scale from zero to eight percent land is fixed at six percent and properties above one million is seven and a half percent stamp duty is fixed at 0 0.8 Legals of conveyancing, typically 1% plus VAT, 
VAT is 23% on most services. Incidentals, including notary expenses and so on, is 500 around. And um, if you buy out of administration, which these days is quite difficult to do and quite complex, you're exempt from transfer tax. Um, what I would make a point um, here is that we get the question asked, um, especially with people who are accustomed to buying, for example, in France or in Spain, and in Spain there's also a golden visa program. Um, the notary in Portugal plays a much less important role than in some of these other countries, where the notary, the notaire in France or the notario um, in, in, in Spain would play a more central role. Here, the lawyer in Portugal is an essential element to, to ensuring a clean transaction and vetting the paperwork. And then the notary is really a, a government or pseudo-government official that will validate, stamp, produce the paperwork and charge for that, you know, read out aloud the contracts and stuff like that. The golden visa application and cost and procedures. Um, so there's a government fees around 5,300 per applicant and around um, half of that per renewal. Then there's a processing, processing fee per main applicant and then a, a processing fee per family men, member. Um, most lawyers charge, and forgive me for giving such a wide range, there, there are even some lawyers who charge a little bit less because they will bundle both services into one, but you will be quoted anything from 3,000 to 10,000, sometimes more or less. So, so do try to talk to, to firms such as ours in terms of validating whether these costs are reasonable because it does depend on your personal circumstances and situations and some situations you may have a more complex situation or, 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 or circumstance which means that the lawyers have to provide more advice and if you have a simple uh, process then the time that they spend will necessarily be less so i think we we, we always caution uh, you know uh, uh, the taking uh, taking these processes with a bit of pinch of salt in the sense that you do need to interview a few law firms and 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 find the best fit for your for yourself uh, typically it's a process that takes around six months for the um, for the application to to be processed but very importantly for those who take uh, who apply for this before the end of the year in a high density area your rights under the golden visa program are guaranteed okay as an alternative to this, um, what is now becoming the most popular option for residency in Portugal, and it's called the D7 um, uh, visa. What is it? Well, it's an income-based residency visa. You have to prove your income. And this can be either, this is important for a lot of people, it can be obtained either via a property purchase with no minimum value, so unlike the golden visa, or via a long-term residential rental contract. Um, if I have some time, I'll talk about these different types of rental contracts and how some embassies or rather consulates are accepting or not some, some, some contract. But these, these are, um, these are uh, um, um, uh, uh, the, the program will accept either a rental or a, or a, or a purchase. Um, they can be combined with a tax program as long as, of course, the applicant qualifies. The application must be done from the country of origin. So there's a question we often get asked. And some of the challenges which, which indicate that you typically have to have someone hand-holding or helping you is that it does require gathering different information and data, and not all of it is easy to understand. If you're Portuguese, for example, and you're accustomed to quite a, a lot of bureaucracy, then perhaps it doesn't seem so difficult. But we have a lot of people that are a bit confused about bringing together this data, the timing and so on. COVID-19 means that there's a huge difficulty in traveling to Portugal to deal with these in situ and personally, which means that many of these um, requirements need to be dealt with at a distance. Um, there is a huge challenge in, in dealing with multiple service provider, um, but not necessarily having enough information yourself to deal and or to, to, to validate or vet the quality or the experience of these providers. Um, cost, we have seen, unfortunately, some intermediaries start to charge exorbitant rates for doing very simple things. The other day I heard someone was charging 500 or 600 euros to get a fiscal number, which is something that costs around 10 euros if you do it in person. So clearly, if someone does this on your behalf, they must charge something, but 500 seems excessive to me to deal with such a simple task. Um, and then there's often the risk of the expat serving a fellow expat um, um, phenomenon, which is, you know, if I am 
um, Portuguese and I go to the United States and then I find a follow, fellow Portuguese and they, oh, they speak my language and they have my accent, then I'll gravitate towards them. But they may not necessarily be the best person um, to, to, to assist me in that task. Why not take a local person, you know, an American in that case, and say, well, help me with the, you know, the, 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 um, the, 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 uh, the visa application or local lawyer or so on. The same thing applies in reverse. Be wary of necessary. I'm not saying that people um, are or are not qualified. Just be wary um, in the moment of need to sort of gravitate towards a fellow countryman or countrywoman um, just for the comfort factor uh, where you should be looking at all options in the market. That's, that's something that does occur. Um, many service providers are local or regional, and it's difficult to figure out which one to use if you don't know where you will settle. So this is often happens with someone who hasn't been to Portugal before or doesn't know it well. They know what more or less they'd like, but they haven't seen the places to know. So try to work with, with someone who actually covers multiple regions so that you have the ability to, to work with that intermediary or that partner um, across different areas. Be ready for slow follow-up. You know, it's influenced by busy people, holidays, language barriers, and the like. But do not expect that if you're accustomed to coming from, for example, an Anglo-Saxonic or a Germanic country, that you will get the same responsiveness from a Latin Southern European country. It will not happen in the main, generally. So please prepare yourself for that sort of that sort of disappointment. Um, you know, otherwise you will be seriously disappointed. Um, and then the other thing, which is very frustrating, even for us, and that is. The consulates themselves, when they apply and take your application, they may apply rules inconsistently. So you may say some, you may hear someone else, a fellow countryman or countrywoman that has said, listen, I got my D7 using a, a short term rental on a three month basis and your consulate's asking for a yearly. I mean, this is, um, it's, it's sad, but it still does happen. And we are still moving towards a, um, a hominid sort of, a homogeneous type approach across all consulates, but it doesn't happen necessarily at the moment. So in a summary format, these are the differences between the D7 and the golden visa. Um, the, the investment level dependent on a region, that is very much the case of the golden visa. The D7, you, you're not limited anywhere depending on a certain level of investment. Rental or purchase, D7 you can use either. A golden visa you can't rent and you can only purchase and within the threshold of your golden visa you cannot use Portuguese debt. If you do an equity release somewhere else and then use that as a cash purchase in Portugal, no problem, but you cannot take on local debt from a local Portuguese bank. Um, there are no minimum levels of investment required for the D7, there are for the golden visa. No change is expected for D7, the high density will end for the golden visa by the end of the year. In presence, in country presence required, typically the D7 will require you to be resident in Portugal and at a general level that requires 183 days of presence, continuous or non-continuous in the country per year and the fiscal year is the calendar year. You'll see I'm trying to answer as many questions as I can while I talk on this. Um, the golden visa, typically one week per annum. There are pre-requirements in both, typically around um, clean criminal records and the like. Um, you can apply for the non-habitual residency status, theoretically, in both cases. But in the case of the golden visa, typically you have to be resident. And that, in most instances, uh, negates the reason why most people go for the golden visa, which is that they can't or don't want to spend as that much time in country. So it's very rare to find, in fact, I don't know any, of people who are non-full-time resident golden visa investors who also have NHR. Okay, multiple properties. Yes, for the golden visa, it's not really applicable for the D7 because why would you buy multiple properties if you don't need to? And then the risk of overpriced properties, it's medium on the D7, especially in certain areas on the rentals. And then it's there is a fairly high risk of overpricing on golden visa um, properties um, in, in the more popular areas. I'm not going to go through a lot of detail on this slide, which is to, to you, but you should as someone who is looking at 
comparing the D7 versus the Golden Visa, you should actually decide whether you are more of a rental, a buying or a rent before buying candidate, because that will influence which residency route you may take. Clearly, if rental is involved in it, the Golden Visa is a no-no. So you will have to go down the D7 or a similar the D2 uh, type route. Um, but you need to analyze yourself, depending on your personal circumstances, which, um, which one of those is, is more applicable. And we have listed some questions there, which you might as an audience want to run um, through yourselves in order to understand which, um, which uh, is, is best. I wanted to also um, delve into a bit more detail on the D7, because we get really a lot of these requests. And there are three categories of information that you need to pull together for a D7. The first is what we call category A, and this is key information that needs to be required, uh, or gathered rather, in the country of origin. Okay, you will need to do this by yourself largely, sometimes with a little guidance. And we always say, don't let anyone say that they can substitute you in this step because they will not be able to. Those who are in, you know, in places like the UK or the US, um, the Portuguese consulates use a, a company called VFS. All the documentation has to flow through VFS. It doesn't matter if I'm a lawyer or if I'm a consultant and I tell you I can help you. you I will not be able to submit these things on your behalf. They are personal and you will need to do them yourself. So things such as proof of income from pensions, investments and the like, criminal clearance um, from the country of residence, typically 12 months. If you've lived in multiple, you will need to get multiple. The identification, your letter of motivation, and all this needs to be put together by yourself, with obviously a little help here and there if you need it. The second category is category B, and this is information that must be obtained in Portugal or from Portugal, but often you're at a distance, so you can't do it yourself because you're not physically there. And this is typically where you need some assistance, you can use a lawyer that will tend to be expensive if you use them only for this. Um, so there are many um, agencies or assisting agencies or company like ours that deal with migration that will assist you um, in multiple areas beyond just these uh, uh, points. So the five key points, we call them the big five. Uh, they're getting a fiscal number, getting fiscal representation for non-EU nationals, health insurance initially for traveling um, under the D7 application, a local ba bank account, which has to be funded, and there's debate about how much is, uh, uh, it has to be funded, proof of accommodation, either rental contract or proof of ownership of a home. And then the third step, which is category C, and that's for many people who do obtain residency, but this is not compulsory for the application, but it's very useful to have. Um, the first is a Forex account to save money on international transfers if you're not coming within the EU or the Euro, uh, the EU area, which if you're attending this presentation in principle, you're not. Health insurance once residency is granted, so private health insurance to complement your national health insurance, and then tax status, status such as the NHR. And then briefly, and this is a guideline, so please don't go out into the market then and say, oh, Luis de Silva told me you'll definitely charge me this. Um, this depends on the supplier uh, and it will vary. But category A, um, which is what you gather in country, there is a um, uh, the proof of income, pensions and so on. This is your cost, your time, typically at zero cost. Criminal clearance. Um, low cost, I've actually picked these out for, for, from one of our American presentations, uh, typically less than $100, for example, if you're doing that, higher if you're using an expediter, very cheap in the UK, for example, if you're getting this from, from the relevant authorities to prove that you have no criminal record. Um, and then VA, VFS fees are very moderate for families, they're a few hundred um, the equivalent of a few hundred euros or a few hundred pounds, uh, uh, sorry, dozens, I should say, not hundreds, dozens. But if there's a family or additional support required, they may go to a few hundred euros. So that, that first category is not expensive. The second category need also not be expensive because depending on how you put it together, um, the, the, the costs may be low or high. So if you use, for example, 
um, a professional such as an accountant or a lawyer, it is likely that they will charge a fairly substantial sum to do all this, uh, typically in the thousands of euros. But if you use someone who brings together these solutions or you do it yourself, you will find that you will be spending probably a few hundred euros. Okay, um, that is a myth that you can do this all yourself. Um, even if you actually take the action, um, you will always be consulting with fellow people, um, you know, fellow, not fellow people, fellow countrymen or countrywomen, of course, there'll be people, um, um, experts and, and whatever, and you will be picking the brains of people. So um, I get quite irritated, to be very frank, for people to say that they did it all alone. They didn't all alone. There was a, there was a, a, a gracious soul somewhere on the other side of a, of a Facebook group or an email or whatever that actually helped them and guided them or gave them an introduction to someone. So please, you can't do this alone, but you can do it with help from other people. And that need not always be expensive. Firms like us, we sell services, of course, but you don't always need to use us. And, and there are many services that we provide and others like us provide that are very cost effective. And honestly, if you, if you paid 50 euros to get a fiscal number, if you, by the time you spend two hours investigating, unless you don't really value your time at all, those 50 euros are peanuts and, you know, and, and, um, and they, should be, they should be paid anyway. So... Those are some of the costs. I won't dwell on those much more um, uh, anymore because I want to get to the questions. And I'm just going to point out in terms of what we do as a business, where you can find some more information on this in addition to emailing us. So um, Property Finder Portugal, which is encompasses this finding of the accommodation solutions for people who are moving to Portugal. You can use that email, um, no problem, and one of the team will respond. Then there are five sites that I would like to point out. If you're looking at retirement living and you just want to get a sense of what retirement in Portugal would like, um, AlgarveSeniorLiving.com is an information-filled site. Okay, you find a lot of information on that. Um, if you're looking at finding properties and searching, the methodology is described at PropertyFinderPortugal.com. If you're looking at an example of the type of winter lets or annual lets and what you'd expect to pay, the style of properties and so on and so forth, look up on Algarve Long Lets. If you're somebody that's looking to retire into a retirement community, then look at a, a project called lugeliving.com. And if you're somebody looking at focusing on the D7, then Move to Portugal 101 actually outlines all the steps and then you'll get a sense of, 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 um, of what is required to put that in place. And then you're never going to remember this, of course, but if you come back uh, to the presentation, we would very much appreciate, and we already have your email addresses, so we're not sort of going after emails, but if you have five minutes and you can, and you can um, uh, respond or, 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 or uh, to the survey which we're running, this is very useful because it adds to the pool of data. We discuss this often with the tourism in Portugal to, to, to try and drive them to, to, to initiate new programs for, for, for expats moving to the country. So this information can then be reused to help, help other, people's, uh, other people similar to yourselves. Okay, now... I'm going to stop sharing my screen, if I may, and I am going to um, just um, bring up some of the questions that I have been asked or that have been sent to me um, from, um, from all of you. Um, and what I'm going to do initially is I'm just going to read out the question and then I am going to, um, well, give an answer, hopefully, and once I've completed those questions, I will also come to the Q&A because I know that there are a number of questions that have come up um, onto the, um, um, on the, uh, the, the, the Q&A. So while I'm answering these questions, please feel free to add additional questions onto the Q&A and we will try to get through as many of those as, um, uh, as possible. Right. So... The first question, and this is in order that they've been received, so the people who signed up first jotted down their questions first, and I'm just reading those out first. I haven't, I haven't really gone through all of them. I just took a quick look through, so forgive me if I'm seeing them for the first time as you are, as you are listening to them. So question is, 
I have a Spanish nationality friend currently living in Portugal. In my D7 application, can I say that I'll stay with him as my proof of address? The short answer is yes. Um, so as long as they provide a letter um, uh, stating that they will effectively host you um, and that is uh, and give the full address, their their um, information and so on, you can use the, the, the address of a friend or family as a proof of address in Portugal for your D7 application. The next question, um, again about the D7. Um, the D7 visa with NHR benefits, planning on residing in Portugal six months plus each year, purchasing modest home. Okay, um, there wasn't really a question, but let me let me see if I can turn it into a question. So the first part of that point is, can you use the D7 visa and then apply for NHR? The answer is yes, as long as you qualify for the NHR. And I should point out that the non-habitual residency is um, is a is a low tax program, which which um, applies to basically two broad categories of people. The first category, which is the one that most people hear about, are pensioners. So anyone with a pension typically would be um, in an NHR category. Okay, they would qualify for low tax regime because they're bringing in money from outside the country, regular remittances to Portugal, and that regular remittance is a pension. The second is a group of, of um, um, professions which is listed on a government uh, website. And if you are, if you fall into one of those categories of professions, then you will qualify um, for the NHR as long as you meet a few other criteria such as you haven't lived in Portugal for the last five uh, tax years and you have a fiscal number which most people get anyway. So you will qualify and you can overlay that onto your residency. So the most important thing is these are two separate aspects. The first one is your residency. You first got to get into the country if you don't have the automatic um, ability to do so. So in other words, if you're not an EU citizen and under freedom of movement, you have to apply for a visa. We've talked about two of these visas. And then once you have the residency visa, you can overlay that with a um, with a NHR status, which is a tax status. Um, the person also pointed out in this point about six months plus each year. Yes, the D7 visa requires 183 days continuous or non-continuous in the country and a modest home. Well, you can be as modest as you like. As long as you have a residence, the government will not be looking at how much you paid for it or how much you're paying for the rent. All they want to see is that you have the ability to to establish roots in the country, a degree of permanence, and that means coming with a place to stay. Right, next question. Again about the D7. Before starting the D7 application process, how do I apply for a property in Portugal if I don't have family and friends living there? So different question, uh, sorry, different person with the opposite question. This person doesn't have any friends and family. Well, one assumes you're going to rent first. And there are many companies, not least of which our, our own is one of the largest, that offer this sort of service of finding visa compliant rentals. And I won't go into a huge uh, diatribe now about that, but you will need to make sure that the contracts are compliant, that they're long enough. And again, I will say people who know me know that I'm like a broken record on this. Even if your consulate tells you that they will accept a three month rental. Do not do that. Because when you get into the country, there will be a number of other entities, such as the borders agency, SEF, your local municipality, or Junta de Freguesia, your finances, or your fiscal office. Any of those entities are liable to ask you for a proper residential contract. So if you've come on a short Airbnb for three months and suddenly you find yourself and as has happened this year, we've turned away at least 200 people who have all asked us for contracts starting, compliant contracts starting in the summer. Impossible to get because unless you're doing a very bad job of, job of marketing your property, you will at least have some summer rentals. So please, please, if there's anything you take away from this presentation on a D7 side is 
do not go for the easy route of going on Airbnb, negotiating a great winter rate for two or three months, and then finding that you're arriving in Portugal and having to reach out for an urgent compliant contract. Okay. Um, hopefully that's answered that one. What is the process of getting citizenship in Portugal if I have a farmhouse? Right. Well, um, the farmhouse itself is not going to help you qualify. Um, Port Portuguese citizenship is typically possible through one of different um, routes. And this would be, for example, through what we call reagrupamento familiar. So if another family member already is a citizen and you can join um, them. Um, um, but the most typical route is if you've been resident in the country for five years, then you can apply for citizenship. You'll have to do a test, a language test to prove you're sufficiently proficient in Portuguese and so on. But that's that's the route. So the town, uh, sorry, the, the, the I was going to say townhouse, the country house, the farmhouse is only relevant in as much as it provides you with a, a base, a residency, an address from which to get your residency. And from then you get your citizenship. Okay. Next one, any minimum age limit? We are 33. Can a D7 holder work part time or full time? Can I show no passive income but sufficient amount until I'm 60? Well, I'm not quite sure what that other sufficient amount will be until you're 60. Um, but the, the passive income really they they want they want recurring or the, when i say they the government wants to see recurring um income and it must come from a recurring source so if it's work that's typically not passive so a pension would be an investment would be even turning you know um, a bulk pension amount into 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 something that then dribbles out money over the years that could be so these sorts of things are considered um, um, um acceptable Typically, if you're working, then that's not the right visa to, to, to apply for. However, if you do qualify for the D7, you can still work. So unlike the non-lucrative visa in Spain, where you cannot work, thus the name non-lucrative visa, in Portugal, there will be no limitations on the kind of work that you can do within reason, you know, it's legal work. Uh, you'll have to register yourself if you're performing this work um, locally. Or you may have to do some other things if you're doing this internationally. And you can still benefit from the non-habitual residency if you can qualify. So the answer is you can still work. But I'm not convinced from your description in the question that your type of income will qualify for the D7. What are the best ways to avoid high taxation? Well, um, I'm assuming the person is referring to the programs in Portugal, such as the non-habitual residency. Um, because those will be low tax programs. You do not want to come to Portugal to pay low tax. It is a high tax country, generally. As a, as a, as a percentage of, 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 um, of the average income, it is one of the highest in Europe um, and certainly disproportionate to what people earn. So um, you're either coming because you want a calmer life, a lifestyle choice, you know, for all the reasons I've cited in the presentation, or you're coming because of that, and you can manage to get some low tax program, such as the non-habitual residency. Do not come to Portugal, for example, expecting to find easy work or work um, or for low tax. That's not a good fit. Should remote workers go for D2 or um, D7? Um, um, it depends on how entrepreneurial or your activity is. If you're delivering services, and again, I want to caveat this. I'm, I'm giving some general answers based on my interpretation of a question. This is not advice, but simply information aimed at helping you listeners get a sense of what's possible. So um, if you're doing remote work, and you're delivering that as a sort of sole trader, if you will, individual name, a consultant and so on. A D7 as a retiree consultant, for example, is, 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 is great. It's, a, it's the right way. If you're going to create a business and actually make an investment, be entrepreneurial, create a new venture, then the D2 is probably more of, a, of, a, of an applicable um, route. You can still deliver the, 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 the services remotely, but it's in the context of an on, entrepreneurial um, um, venture, if I can put it that way. 
um, D2 versus D7, and what if you start with D? Unfortunately, the person's put ampersand, which I'm assuming is the 7, because it's above the 7. Then get an idea for a business. Can you start one on a D7? Right. I'm assuming the question here is, can you flip between a D7 and a D2? Well, the answer is probably you don't need to, because if you've been approved under a D7, you wouldn't restart the process because the D2 is also applied for from another country and you're already in the country under a D7, so you wouldn't bother doing that. Um, does investing in or buying into a company make a difference? I'm not only going to cover this, but there is a possibility of getting a golden visa, which involves investment into turning around a failing um, Portuguese com company. Obviously, you need to do due diligence on that, but I'm not going to cover that pos that topic, but it is possible. Tax implication of both Golden Visa and Visa D7. Thanks. Um, well, there are many. This is, this is one I'm not going to talk about because it depends on whether you get a special tax status like NHR, and every situation is um, individual. It will involve considering your taxes in other jurisdictions, including the jurisdiction in which you currently live, as well as the residence jurisdiction, which will be Portugal. And it will depend on your nationality, because if you're American, for example, you're taxed on worldwide income, regardless of where you live. If you're um, um, domiciled um, in, in the UK, but non-resident, there will be a, 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 a certain um, a, a way of treating taxes. If you're Portuguese, for example, um, um, and not resident in Portugal, then you will only um, uh, be dealing with taxes um, um, on your Portuguese income. So this is very much an individual situation and you need to take advice on that. I can't even start to, 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 to talk about that. Right, international school, public school, which one is less using Portuguese? International school monthly fee, how to open small business in Portugal? Well, middle class monthly expenses, right. Um, international schools are concentrated around the main areas, the Algarve, Greater Lisbon and Porto, a couple just further south near Setubal, um, as well, um, one or two in Coimbra. Um, the average fees for schools um, are in the range of 5,000 to 15,000 euros per pupil per year, per annum. Um, and there are several following, following different um, uh, programs, the Deutsche Schule, the Lycée Français, um, the, the Carlucci, for example, um, American school, plenty of English um, uh, schools um, following the English curriculum. So you have a range of, 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 of options, including um, education styles such as Montessori and the like. Those are the sorts of prices that you will you will pay. pay. Um, monthly expensive. I'm not sure what you will consider middle class. Middle class in the UK is very different to middle class from a financial perspective in Portugal. But typically, uh, people Portuguese people can live um, between a thousand and um, and often less. I mean, the minimum wage is um, seven hundred and something. Um, uh, euros per month once you've worked it out on a 12 month basis. So, so you know, you, you, I would say between excluding accommodation, 750 to 1,500 euros easily with accommodation, that depends on the accommodation. So, 1,000 to 2,500 euros um, is the sort of range that most people, on which most people live. Another one on the D7. For the D7 visa, do we really need to make a physical visit to Portugal for a rental lease? No. Bank account? No. NIF, although it's difficult, the bank account is one of the most difficult ones. NIF? No, that's easy. Before we can submit our application. If you go into move to Portugal 101.com again, that will set out all the all these steps and all those steps can be done at a distance with a bit of time. OK, and timing is also very crucial on the D7 because you can't start too early because a number of 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 um, of steps and documents have a validity date. You can't you know, you can't um, you can't they can't be. Uh, older than three months or six months or whatever. So you also can't start too early. Okay. Uh, the quarantine requirement makes travel very difficult these days. It does indeed. I can tell you. I speak from experience. Very, very difficult. And I'm fully vaccinated. And I have also got both. Um, I've got two passports, the EU vaccine passport and the UK vaccine passport digitally. And even then, I still sometimes have to get extra tests and so on and so forth. What is the best investment to buy to prove eligibility for D7 visa? Well, you don't have to buy an investment. You just have to buy something you can live in. 
So um, perhaps you can separate separate out these two things. Um, but if you're asking, if you're only going to spend six months in your property and the next and the other six months renting it out, then you need to analyze um, this on a case by case basis. What I would say is if you're applying for D7, you want to live somewhere. So I would not look at this as an investment first. I would first look at where you want to live. And that may in imply having to rent first and then buy. But don't constrain yourself by by trying to figure out what what to to um, uh, to to buy as an investment and then find that it's not something in which you wish to live. So so please be conscious of that. This should be a, a personal decision, you know, from a buying perspective. So we are about a, up in an hour, but I still have it easily enough for at least 15 minutes of questions. So um, if those of you um, need to, to sign out, please do and we'll publish this. But happy for you to stay on and, and you know, there's still more than, I don't know, 50, 60 people on board. So so feel free to, to keep listening and I will continue to answer questions. The requirements for D7 seem to change often more restrictively. How can I apply at the consular office via VFS Global and expect to meet them all? Well, two points I would make. First, you're absolutely right. They do change and tend to be more strict. And I, for one, am all in favor of that. I will be honest with you. I was not happy at all that I was getting applications from people on a short-term rental, you know, and then hopping around um, and then and then coming around and, and, and sort of emergency um, contracts, you know, having got sort of a, a, a cheap one-month rental or whatever. It, it's, it's not fair on the people who do it correctly. Um, and I, for example, couldn't move into another country um, on the basis of, of skewing the requirements. So I, I openly declare that I'm all in favor of defining the rules and sticking to the rules and that they be strict if they need to be strict so that everyone has to adhere to them. Now, having said that, it is sad that the consulates are not being consistent in their application of the rules. And the way to, to, to overcome this is to do one of two things. That is to look at the worst case scenario. So I'll use two examples, funding of a bank account. You may get one consulate that says um, uh, they need 7,000 euros in an account and another one that says they need 12,000. Well, go for the 12,000. Not that you'll get a choice of consulate, but I'm just using this as an example. Go for the 12,000 and fund it with 12,000 so that you don't get rejected on that basis. Okay, the money is yours. No one's taking it. It's not going anywhere. So it's sitting there. You will use it eventually. Okay. The other thing is with a lease, a, an old bugbear of mine, and that is please do not take a, a one or a three month lease, or whatever. Make it easier for the person on the other side to approve your application. Get a proper, you know, minimum six month lease between six months and one one year lease. Now, make sure that it's got the right format and standard so that you don't give the person on the other side an excuse to turn you down on that point. It's just very simple. OK, so and it can all be done remotely. We do this all the time, weekly for people all on all these tasks, but please try not to approach us or any other firm at the last minute because we cannot perform miracles and often we are constrained by the workings of the government offices, whether they be issuing a fiscal number or or giving you issuing you a piece of paper saying X, Y or Z or Z. It doesn't matter. We don't control the timings often. OK, the visa approval itself tends to be quite quick. It's the organizing the paperwork that must be well managed. Oh, then we have a long question. How about seven points? Let's see if I can pick out a few. If one purchased a property to provide an address before the D7 visa, but gets denied, will one be able to turn the property to GV application? Well, my first response to that is um, look at the reason why you were denied. Um, you know, it's uh, if it was because the the you won't be denied if you've brought a property. So that's not the reason. So if you've been denied based on something else, it's unlikely that the that the golden visa is going to sort the problem out because the problem is not with the accommodation. OK, it's because there is no requirement to buy a property. So if you've got a properly deeded um, property, properly deeded property in your name, then you can then you can uh, certainly qualify on the basis of, of, of the property. Uh, do the GV Qualified Investments Fund ever decrease in value and can investor 
uh, lose money? Well, theoretically, yes, because it's a fund and values can go up as they can go down. So I'm not talking about funds here, but it's an investment. So there is risk in relation to any investment, as there is with real estate. The market can crash in 2000 as it did in 2008 and 2009. So please understand that none of these things that you do, such as a, an investment fund or even real estate, you know, obviously real estate is generally very safe and over time is an appreciating asset. But there are risks associated with all things in life and this will be no different, but, but clearly some offer less risk. Is it common for Portugal real estate agents to represent both buyer and seller simultaneously? Yes, unfortunately, in my uh, opinion. Is it the case, however, that one of the agent is working for both sides and this undermines the interests of the buyer or the seller? Well, most agents, um, you know, and, and, and we are an agent ourselves, um, but we are a finder agent, so we don't list properties in Portugal, we, we find properties. But most agents will tell you they will work in your best interest, and most will. And let's be fair. I mean, there are many, many good professionals in the market, and they will. But I have a point, and those who know the U.S. market will understand that there is a difference between a buyer and a seller. And I'm a big believer that a buyer should be represented by a buying agent or by a finder agent. And they, should, and they should try to work with that person, if possible, exclusively, and give them the trust. And that trust must be earned. And what you will do in return is that person will work for you and will work hard for you. And they will find many options. They will not be trying to sell you necessarily a single product or a range of products from their portfolio. They will go out to the market and find what's available and act in your best interest. So, in a short answer to your question, Anyone, any agent, and even in good faith, because there are fantastic agents all over the world, just as there are some bad ones as well, but there are some fantastic agents everywhere. But if anyone tells you that they are less motivated or more motivated to go and talk to a partner agent um, than they are to sell their own inventory, that, I would argue, is stretching the truth a little bit, especially because the remuneration model in most of the real estate agencies um, in Portugal, we're talking as a Portuguese presentation, is based on the success of selling their real estate, their listings. They get more commission because they don't have to share. So it's just the logic. It's a business of making money. They sell money by selling real estate. And therefore, um, it's logical that they would make more money if they don't share. So I'm not because we are a buyer agent. But because I believe in, not only I should say because we're a buyer agent, but because I believe in that model, um, the buyer agent should, wherever possible, be separate to the selling agent. Okay, And that means that the buyer agent will earn less because they will have to share with someone. But that's okay. That's okay because they can do a good job. Um, are there government websites where you can check the uh, valid validities of brokers and businesses? Yes, in PIC and um, in Portugal, list the agents, the listing agents. Um, I'm going to jump over because this person's had a lot of time already. Um, so I'm going to jump to the next person. That person can always write back to me or I'll respond um, afterwards with, with the answer to the other questions. As a British citizen, I arrived in the EU before Brexit and COVID. Um, so if it was before Brexit and COVID, that was probably before March of 2020, because I caught COVID in March of 2020, I, and I was one of the early victims of COVID, um, but have not been able to leave. I have Greek residency, but been in Italy over a year under COVID and not been able to obtain residency due to living on a boat. Would I be able to get a D7 visa? So the short answer is yes, but you will need to comply with the residency requirements, so the proof uh, the the um, what do you call it the 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 uh, security um, um, clearance uh, criminal records clearance certificate of the countries in which you have been staying and you need to be prove you need to prove that you have been staying there so if you cannot prove you've been living on a boat you may have to move back to your home country and apply from your home country after having been there for twelve months okay so can I apply for NHR on a golden visa. Um, if I only plan spending about 7 to 14 days in Portugal, and what is the process? Simple answer, no. Um, how long does it take to apply from D7 and get the visa? Um, it takes about 3 to 6, uh, sorry, it takes a, about um, a, a, a month to a month and a half, depending on criminal certificates, typically to put together the information. And it typically takes, allow about 3 months for the process to get approved, because there's a statutory 
maximum, which I believe is 90 days. I could be wrong on this. 90 days. But some consulates are delivering the, the visas a lot quicker, sort of less than 60 days. So um, a month to a month and a half uh, to get the stuff ready. Um, three months for the application. Six months total for the entire process. Not longer because there will be limitations on the validity of uh, some of the documents that you're expected to provide and you know make sure of those right now I'm going to jump jump over to the uh, uh, I'm try, right to the chat right what is the minimum monthly income required associated with requirement associated with the d7 uh, and again I'm going to try and rush through these um, um, sorry I didn't start at the start but I'll just answer that one anyway uh, typically we use a benchmark which is double the minimum wage so around 1300 euros per per, per applicant um uh, per month uh, should do it um you then have to um you then have to prove funding or bank um account um please send your contact details um we'll 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 post the presentation um uh, but i will just uh, property finder Portugal. Let's see if I don't make any um, spelling mistakes here. Um, I will type this in here in propertyfinderportal.com, and you can email. Um, uh, but it'll be on the presentation slides as well. Next question was: Can I apply to D7 from abroad? You must um, apply from abroad. And is this guarantee for me and my family? Um, um, the, the short answer is yes. If they are dependent. Um, but the process of dependency um, can vary. You can either apply for multiple people using separate D7 processes, or you can use what we call a reagrupamento familiar, which is family regrouping. Portugal is very family friendly. We do not like to separate families. And as a result, as long as you find someone who is able to properly manage this process, um, I hear very few cases of people being rejected at uh, family regrouping. Um, be aware that you have to prove, even with children and with parents, I'm not sure if brand, grandparents qualify, I would have to check, but anyway, with immediate descendants and ascendants, ascendants they have to prove, you, you, you have to prove their dependency. So, for example, um, up to 25 years old, you can have a child register on the golden visa, for example, as long as they're in full-time full education and dependent on you. Um, similar sort of process with the D7 in terms of uh, dependency, um, but it's a bit it's it's a bit less straightforward because you've got to figure out how many of you are actually going to apply for the D7 itself, or you have a main applicant and then you join the family to that application. So. It's one to discuss in detail, and it's the kind of one where we would get you to um, also talk to an immigration lawyer because that's important in terms of defining the, the solution. Right. Can the D7 lead to citizenship over a period of time? Yes. It's a residency, same as a golden visa or anything else, same sort of criteria. You have temporary residence for the, for the, for the period um, of five years, and then you can apply for the permanent residency thereafter and for the citizenship. Okay, sorry, you get the permanent resident actually after the five years and you comply for the citizenship. Um, next question. Let's see. I don't know. Somebody is publishing their um, um, address in Santa Monica, California. So I don't know what the question is, um, but oh, maybe they're signing their question. Um, but anyway, you would have to apply to San Francisco because Santa Monica is Southern California. And so in SoCal, you, you, you apply to, Cam to San Francisco. Um, if I can continue working at the same job from Portugal, yes, if your employer allows you to do so. Um, and can the salary from that job be considered part of the D7 income? Typically, no. But again, for both of those questions, um, we would um, we would recommend taking some advice because there will be a there will be an implication for the employer potentially in terms of um, employing somebody within the EU or having somebody in the EU working for them. So this is not an easy to answer question. And I prefer to take that one off offline with a lawyer. Is there a minimum net worth requirement for the golden visa? No. 
Uh, there isn't, and we are not, oh, sorry, should I decide to use your services? Absolutely not. We, not. we ask you no intrusive questions about your net worth. If you can afford to buy the golden visa, you can afford to buy the golden visa, um, and we will, we will handle all, all clients on the same basis, on the basis of the golden visa, not on your net wealth. Um, you know, and, and what I would say as well is, unless you absolutely have to for reasons of, you know, other reasons, mortgages on uh, properties or whatever, don't declare your net wealth. It's not a relevant um, um, piece of information at this stage for, for someone who may be um, sort of helping you with, with um, the process. I argue, you know, um, I could be proven wrong on this. I'm getting a slight um, screen block here. Um, so... What is the minimum monthly? I've answered that. As a cryptocurrency investor in my, uh, myself, is crypto tax in Portugal? Ah, good question. Um, well, wasn't intended to cover crypto here. Crypto um, is taxed if um, it is a day trading type exercise, but it's not if it's a long term hold. Now, I'm not sure whether I've disappeared because my screen has now frozen. And I'm not sure whether the people are still listening and hearing me. Um, so, um, and I can't even move my, my cursor. So this may just be Zoom kicking us off the webinar. Um, which is strange because we have an unlimited membership. <clears throat> right, well, ladies and gents, I, I'm not sure whether you can actually see or hear me, but I, I can no longer see. Oh, hang on. Let's see what's going on here. Um, I'm having some technical issues here, and I'm I'm loath to reboot the um, entire present uh, uh, computer because it may then with oh hang on we're back apologies for that ladies and gentlemen we we went off air I was just about to sign off but I will keep going so cryptocurrency question um, crypto is taxed if it is a trade trading exercise. Um, and it's not, I believe, if you, it's a long-term hold. Okay, so again, one which we have specialist um, lawyers who who deal with um, crypto traders. If you need introductions in that sense, we are happy to to do that. Um, next question: What are the documents accepted for proof of income for D7? Is a tax return required or bank statements and contract? A combination of all of the above. Um, again. Fairly detailed question, but um, we can help out with 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 sort of um, explaining that. But a combination of those typically typically is useful. Um, can income from crypto be used as income when applying for D7 visa? Not sure is my honest answer. I would have to check up on that. Uh, my gut feel. Well, I'm not going to take a gut feel. But I'm not going to I'm not. Uh, 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 I'm not going to take a punt on that. I, I can certainly check that out. Um, thank you for sharing, excellent presenter. Oh, thank you. Do you have a Canadian rep? We we don't. Um, they can connect. Well, um, uh, this person can certainly email me if they're interested in in helping us out in Canada. The D seven requires one eighty three days residency. We want to know or care if some of that time was spent elsewhere in the EU with travel done by land. Well, clearly, um, I can't answer that question, but. You know, increasingly, especially in COVID times, there are checks at borders. And if you find yourself in another country having declared that you were in another country or in a different country, you may find you know, yourself caught out. So what I would say is, you know, don't do it. You know, if, 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 if the plan is to come to Europe um, and then travel around, you can already do that with a residency. But try to pick a country in which you're going to, you know, spend enough time as your home and that you like that country. Um, 
Um, so is liquid net worth a proxy for stable income? As a general answer, initially I didn't think so, but people are being approved um, on D7s on the basis of their net worth and proving that they have, for example, certain assets sitting in bank accounts and the like. So, so, um, so then, um, so th the short answer is yes, but I wouldn't guarantee it because I, I have seen some discretion on this basis on the D7. Um, right. During the 183 day residency requirement, can one travel to other Schengen countries during this 183 and not jeopardize the D7 status? Um, a bit linked to the previous question, the fifth, what counts here is, is the 365 days and 183 days within it. So you can, of course, travel to other countries within the EU in the Schengen area and so on, um, as long as you spend your 183 days in the country, in this case, Portugal, that has granted you the residency. OK, so that's important. You know, you're not you're not sort of locked down now suddenly in some way. I mean, of course, you may be because of COVID rules, but but from a visa perspective, you're not locked down. You can travel around. What documents? OK, I need to prove income from a property rental agreement. Um, yes, rental agreement. So the question here, what documents are needed to prove income from a property rental agreement? Um, uh, no, I would say more than that. The rental agreement is good, but um, we'd like to see some bank statements where the money has come in. And the more history you have, the better your application if you're using a rental income. Okay, if you're pitching up with five rental properties and all a new contract, um, I think there may be some questions asked as to how reliable the source of income is. So the more history you have, the better it is as a source of income. Okay, um, right. Next question. Uh, sorry, a lot of you are saying that I was back. Sorry about that freeze um, in the middle there. Um, do you pay income tax in both Portugal and country of citizenship? Um, potentially, yes. Oh, sorry, that is retirement income. It it's a, this is one of those it depends questions. OK, um, what what we can say generally as a rule is that if the country with which to which you're referring has a double taxation agreement with Portugal and Portugal has many um, double taxation agreements, 140 or so, um, I may be wrong on that, but it's, it's a lot, then you will never pay tax twice. OK. Um, you never pay tax twice. This is the principle of a double taxation. The details I would prefer to discuss, not as an expert advisor on that, but discuss with you individually um, if you have that question so that I can refer you to the right sort of advisor. OK, um, because if you have, for example, the non-habitual residency status, then you will be able to use that as a tax mitigation um, 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 mechanism, if you will, but your citizenship may still dictate that you nonetheless have to pay tax in another a country. The other problem is the other way around. If you move residency to Portugal, you may have to pay more tax if you don't have a special status in Portugal on your worldwide income, okay, because it is a worldwide income for residents in Portugal. And so you may need to pre prepare in advance of moving to Portugal. Things such as exemption on 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 capital gains of primary residences in other countries where they qualify for that. You may be tax exempt from a capital gain on a primary residence while you're resident of the other country, but you will no longer be exempt if you move to Portugal because it'll be considered income. So therefore, or capital gains. So so you will then have to pay tax at whatever rate it is. You know, um, fifty percent or twenty eight percent if you're a resident. So, um you will need to be careful and planning is essential if you have a complex tax um, um, scenario and you will need to consult with a relevant professional in order to to uh, um, um, do this what kind of independent professional work is allowed in pt for the d7 visa well any legal um, uh, professional work is allowed uh, typically it isn't um it it isn't limited at all you're qualified to do what you're qualified to do and you can do it from a tax mitigation perspective and qualifying for the NHR, uh, um, um, uh, what do you call it, um, status, that will then be profession related. You will have to have certain skills and fall into certain professions. But that's a different. If you're, if you're not applying for NHR, you can do whatever type of work, as long as it's legal, you can do whatever type of work you like 
um, in Portugal and deliver that work in Portugal or remotely and pay the relevant tax. Is there a minimum income requirement? What if one were to deposit, let's say, five years of that requirement in a Portuguese bank? Does that put to bed the income requirement? Um, I, I'm sure you've noticed by now that I don't like to cop out of answers, but this is one of, it may be and it depends one, okay? We've had very inconsistent um, applications of this sort of rule um, and really the only thing we can, we can um, suggest in, is, is to liaise with your local consulate and ask them the questions. I know it sounds really strange, but we would literally ask you to tell them, show them the stuff and kind of almost do a pre, a, a pre vetting either via, via VFS. Sometimes we can facilitate um, the contacts of someone at, at the consulate and try and check it out. Um, the general rule, route is you've got to prove the passive income, but sometimes you can prove as an alternative the 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 um, the, the the sort of the, sort of a, a, a holding of sorts okay if one is approved for d7 but later it turns out that one cannot live 183 days in portugal can one then change it to a gv well you couldn't change it to a gv but you could still apply for the golden visa remembering that if you have bought a property for as the qualifying accommodation for the for the uh, D7, that that property may not of itself qualify for the golden visa. Okay, you may have to do it again. Okay, and if you've rented for the D7, well, definitely you you'll need to buy something for the golden visa. But the short answer is yes, you can start again with the process. Right now, I've got through all the for through the chats. Now I'm going on to the Q and A. Um, so. I'm not going to answer live or type an answer. I'm just going to read out the question and then um, just say verbal, verbally the answer because otherwise I'm, we'll, never, we'll never leave here. What are the documents that are accepted for proof of income for D7? Is it tax return required or bank statements? Well, I think I've answered that already. Combination um, is best. What would be a good amount of how much would I need to fund my amount for D7? F would 15,000 euros for one person be enough? My guess is yes because we've had applications approved for less. Um, um, numbers of anywhere between 9,000, 7,000, 9,000, 12,000, 15,000, 18,000, they've all been mentioned. But yeah, uh, yes, probably is the answer. Can the D7 lead to citizenship? Uh, I think we've answered yet, that that's yes. Or is it, um, so D7 or Golden Visa can both lead to citizenship. Um, sorry, that's a repeated question there on the chat. What documents are in? Uh, that's also repeated. Mortgage for ah, mortgage for expats. Say thirty percent is a down payment for first property. Does it does it applicable or is it applicable? I assume to the rest of the properties after that too, or we can get ninety percent or so. No, um, it's applicable to all the properties. The Portuguese lending system is very much based on. Um, your uh, your ability to repay the loan. It's an affordability criteria. I won't go into that at the moment. It's an affordability criteria. So if you can afford to buy five properties, you could afford to, to, to apply for 70% loan to value on all five properties, okay? Um, and so it's, it's solely dependent on affordability and not to do with whether it's a first or second or, or whatever. Um, is it possible to get exploratory visa for D7 or GV in this current scenario? The answer is no. Um, there is no exploratory visa. You either have a tourist visa and you're here exploring as part of a tourist visa. And depending on where you're coming from, you may have to formally apply for a visa or you may be under a visa waiver program. There are many of those. Um, but you, there isn't an exploratory visa for D7 as such um, to explore the area for property buying. What I would say is if you're not certain of where you want to buy and you want to apply for the visa anyway, start with a rental. That's what many people do. Um, and that's the safest way of doing it, especially in COVID times. It, you've got to know, obviously, that Portugal is the place you want to, to which you want to go. But start with the rental. And um, and then you can, you know, and we sometimes help people with this. We'll actually find them rentals um, 
let's say two six month rentals, one in one area of the country and one in another. So they can spend two different periods of time. And this will still be applicable and valid because you'll lock out two contracts, a little bit more difficult to do, but you can do this and investigate different areas of the, of the um, country. Um, the person also asked about NIF, but you can do this all remotely. We can help people do getting the NIF and whatever remotely. I understand that the preparation time, criminal record, bank account, etc., for a GV takes quite long, uh, take quite some time. Not counting the time it takes to find and purchase a property, is an application still possible to qualify under 2021 rules? Let me be clear again about the GV program in 2021. The GV program continues for all low density areas as it is at the moment. There is no change. It only ends for high density residential properties by the end of the year. So if you go back to the presentation, I'm not going to repeat it. If you go back to the presentation, there was a slide on which I actually stated what we thought were reasonable GV categories that were still feasible to get done in 2021, either in low density, any of those, or in the high density areas. Okay, so the short answer is yes. But not everything. If you pick, pick a difficult type of property in golden visa threshold or category, you will run the risk that you will run out of time. I should also make another point here, and that is even if you apply this year, you may find that your application is only approved in 2022, but you will retain the right legally um, for this to the status because it's the application date that counts, not the approval date. I mean, on the assumption that you, you get approved. If you fail for something like, you know, um, criminal record, then that's a different story altogether, of course. Um, so I've talked about the crypto. Um, uh, concerning how to prove income. Right, I think I've answered that one. How do you think the expiration of the golden visa in an area will affect the process of property? I think the person meant prices of property in that area. It's difficult to tell, is the honest answer. Portugal has been more robust in terms of uh, prices holding up than we thought initially. Um, um, and there is essentially still a lack of inventory in the most popular areas. So there may be a slight softening, but this is all speculation in the areas that have been most affected by Golden Visa, like the sort of central Lisbon historical areas and so on. But it's, it's, it's difficult to predict. We will really have to wait and see um, there may even be a positive effect on some of the other areas that um, that are low density and maybe a move to some of those areas. But we don't see, for example, people moving mass inland because simply people want to be on the coast mainly. This is the, where the demographic, even Portuguese people move to the coast. So I wouldn't be comfortable in saying that suddenly there's going to be an exodus and everyone's going to move inland two hours or an hour. That's not going to happen, I don't think. Um, can siblings apply for GV together? Yes, but you still have to pay um, twice the um, <laughs> twice the amount. You can't split. You can't split the um, the amount and sort of do two hundred and fifty thousand each. It's an individual application. Um, if one sibling is dependent on another and you're doing it via family regrouping, that's a different question. Um, how do you think? Oh, sorry, that's that's I've answered that one with the GV. I know I can travel in here, but I live somewhere in there. No, no. So the answer. So can I put the GV in Portugal and live in Italy? The simple answer to that is no. That's the same type of of question. Um, um, sorry, uh, sorry, the GV. Sorry, I thought you were saying the D7. So can I get the GV in Portugal and live in Italy? Tricky question, right? The answer is probably no, because a residence under the GV in Portugal gives you residency rights in Portugal. It doesn't give you residency rights in Italy. You can travel to Italy and visit, but you cannot go and live in Italy. Okay, residency is a is a status uh, uh, conceded by a state, a nation state, and so you cannot use one state to go and reside in another. It's like going to Canada and saying. And I want to go and live in the U.S. Well, the U.S. isn't going to accept you. Canadian visas is irrelevant. Um, so the same thing. OK, you can travel to these places, but you can't go and live in them. Right. Um, then a couple more questions on the chat and then we're going to wrap up. Um, um, is there sorry. Um, can you buy two properties, one 300K and one 200K and apply for GV? Absolutely. 
So multiple properties you'll see on one of the slides, you can do that. You can even do that at 400K if it's a 400K threshold. So you can do this with as many or as few properties as you wish, as long as they um, uh, uh, um, meet the threshold of the visa that of the of the area of the, the level that you're applying for and just to preempt the question if you're buying one property in the let's say three four hundred area and another one in the 500 it's the 500 you one that you've got to satisfy so even if you buy one that you like in the 400 area you've still got to spend five hundred thousand in total okay you can't you can't mix and match areas um if it takes 183 day residency to apply for NHR. Is there any residency requirement after approved? I didn't quite understand that question. I thought I was doing well and then I got thrown this curveball right at the end. Um, so maybe um, if you could send me an email with that one so I can understand that one better, then I'm, I'm pretty certain I'll be able to answer that one. Anyway, ladies and gents, um, We've now dwindled, but there's still quite a number of you on. I've tried to answer as many questions as I could realistically, and I hope that that has been useful um, um, to help you get a sense of of, um, of what the difference is between these two. We will, as soon as, as, soon as our technical team has um, uh, completed the, the process of of cleaning up the video, any bits and bobs at the end, we will be posting a link and we'll email you that to all the um, the attendees, those that, have, those that have continued with us and those that had to leave um, early. Um, I'd like to end uh, by um, saying two things. Firstly, you're very welcome, all of you um, um, in Portugal. It's, it's a very hospitable country. And um, I think it's a country in Europe that has gone out of its way to find residency routes for people um, that choose it as, as a destination. Um, and so please don't hesitate to reach out to us or to others. We hope it'll be us and we hope that we can be able to, we're able to assist. I think it's probably the most interactive webinar number of questions that I've had ever really, uh, given the, the, the proportion of, of participants. So well done on the people um, who've asked the questions and thank you all and stay safe and we hope to hear from all of you in in due in due course thank you very much and stay safe bye bye now